What happens if you take evolution simulation video game The Sapling, design a planet, design a basic alga and a really simple aquatic animal and then turn on random mutations for millions of in-game years? How will life evolve? That is what this YouTube series called Evolution Simulated is about. In this episode we start with a planet where plants are just beginning to stake their claim on land. There are plenty of aquatic animals in the sea and some species even drag themselves onto land to feast on the many plants there, so it's only a matter of time before they adapt to stay on land forever. The questions are, how and where will this happen? And what will these land animals look like? How will they change over time? What I will be describing in this episode is basically one big chain reaction of events. To understand what sets it in motion, we first need to know that most of the soil on this planet is very wet. But on top of that, the random terrain generator has also chosen a number of spots where the ground is exceptionally soft. Places that are very soft and very wet are challenging places for plants to grow. And indeed, until recently, this spot was empty. But now these plants, with roots uniquely suited for soft soil conditions, have conquered the area. As an aside, it's not just the wet and soft ground where specialized plants live. As we've seen before, the area beneath the planet's rings is colder. And here we see that plants have evolved to withstand and even thrive in the chillier temperatures. With its many seeds, this plant is very successful. One of the ways the mutation system in this game works is by copying segments. And this has clearly happened here. It almost looks as if these towers of nuts were created by a human in the plant editor. Besides being a home to these nut towers, the Shadowlands also act as a clear boundary for species who cannot survive there. Despite all species sharing a common ancestor, the southern plants look really different from the northern ones. Ok, back to the plant with the stilt roots. Because it successfully occupies this biome for quite a while, there is plenty of time for genetic experimentation. And one of these experiments will have a lasting impact on our planet. Some of the nuts develop into large hollow structures, allowing it to float on water. This may seem insignificant, but it actually marks the beginning of a long series of events that will change the look of the planet forever. Some of these floating nuts will simply drift to other beaches on the same island, but there's nothing stopping them from finding their way to other islands. And this indeed happens nearly instantly. Initially, these pioneers will only grow in wet clay, like their parents back home. But as always, when a new bit of land becomes available, life adapts quickly. And within only a few hundred years, we already see a grass-like species, and a species adapted for drier land. All of this extra food along the coastline is the final catalyst for a branch of semi-aquatic animals to leave the water for good, and become land animals with a diet that 100% consists of land plants. They are closely related to the species that is so successful because of its instincts, but obviously without a tail. The rapid loss of the tail fin is a clear indicator that this animal has fully switched to land life, as this loss makes it incredibly slow in water. It's an unusually fast transition compared to what you normally see for this game. While this animal is faster on land than it is in water, it's still not fast at all, limiting its ability to reach food during its lifetime. Therefore, evolutionary pressures have favored a smaller body size, so it needs less food to survive. Or perhaps it's the other way around, and the combination of a small body size and air-breathing lungs is what really explains this animal's success. But by sheer coincidence, these animals are not the only new life that has reached this land, because around this time we also see a new family of plants evolving from algae. This new plant family is clearly recognizable because they didn't go through the floating seed bottleneck and thus look noticeably different. They arrive just in time and gain a foothold in the drier soil before the settlers from the center island do. Once a niche is taken, it's much harder to dethrone the existing species. Meanwhile, the nut tower plant we know from the center island expands westwards. The usual lack of variety after a first explorer species reaches new land creates strange, otherworldly scenes. As the years pass, our land animals evolve a faster way to get around, although you can barely see it in the high grass. 
Now with access to more food and a mouth specialized for plants, it doesn't take long before it grows in size again as well. And this mount offers an unexpected side advantage. It can remain underwater for a relatively long time, at least compared to the other mounts in the game. While this is useful for any island species, it is particularly advantageous here, in the wetlands on the northern side of the island. And like that, the northern part of the population is back to a semi-aquatic lifestyle. At the moment, the difference between the northern and the southern animals is limited to behavior, but as we will see, their physical shape will adapt as well. Before the semi-aquatic herbivores arrived, this area was mostly populated by omnivores. As the newcomers are much better at extracting energy from the algae and seagrass over here, and reproduce faster as a result of this, they slowly but steadily manage to outcompete the original population. As the population of our new land dwellers grows, they are forced to explore new lands, and after some time we find them all over the island. In the more crowded places, you also see the presence of animals reflected in the plant life, mainly in the second plant family that emerged on this same island. As all plants either have these seeds, which survive being eaten, or these seeds, which get hooked in fur. These hooked seeds in particular we have seen before, but now the animals suddenly, unwittingly, carry them to new places, greatly increasing their chance of finding new, suitable spots of land to grow. On the west side of the island, another innovation emerges for the animals. Primitive nipples, which can be used to feed the young. The unconventional location of these nipples, namely on top of their heads, does not prevent immediate success for these animals, as the newborns are no longer forced to immediately start looking for food or die. This also allows for some more experimentation when it comes to diet, and these animals become the first land animals to supplement their diet with a nutritious herbivore meat lying around. Meanwhile, we see one branch of the semi-aquatic species transition back to being fully aquatic, with fins for faster swimming. Several other land species have evolved eggs with a harder shell, better adapted for land, but these animals' eggs are still unchanged from the eggs of their ancestors. This means the eggs will still survive both on land and in the sea, so as long as this animal goes up for air every now and then, it can spend its full life in the water. As for plant life, by this time most plant families have developed large round leaves, but interestingly, small pockets of plants with other leaves have developed on all islands. Most of the plants in these pockets do not have seeds that can easily spread over water, so they just stay where they are, unable to expand their territory. For example, here we see these leaves and here we see these ones, which do a little damage if eaten. All islands, except the eastern one with a more developed land life, have aquatic animals dragging themselves around, but that's way less common here, which is perhaps caused by this defense mechanism in the leaves. These plants on the center island, adapted for living in the cold shadow of the rings, are still going strong. The plant family inhabiting the region south of the shadow is also still there, but has drifted towards a somewhat brighter coloration. Intriguingly, the ring has a similar effect on the animals on the neighbor island. Here too, the animals living on the southern side are drifting towards another color, in this case more turquoise. Another difference is that they no longer rely on eyesight, as shown by their simplified eyes. Instead, their primary competitive advantage is that they have the useful instinct to remain south of the shadow. Unlike most other species on the island, where freezing to death is a common death cause. The scientific term for two species growing apart because of a physical barrier like this is called allopatric speciation, and it's something you often see in planets with a lot of islands. How will these animals grow apart once they reach other islands? That will be the topic of the next episode of Evolution Simulated. Hope to see you there.